I would like to welcome uh, all of you to the symposium on James Moroni's most recent book, The Logic of the Social Sciences. Uh, the Social Science, so this was the whole point, singular. Uh, I welcome you on behalf of the Department of Political Science at CU and also uh, on behalf of CU as a whole. And this double welcome stems from my uh, two hats that I'm wearing currently as uh, both professor of political science and uh, pro-rector for external relations. My name is Carsten Schneider. Um, and I'm glad to see so many of you here in the room. We have uh, a group, but online we have a, a larger group. Um, um, and this is despite the hectic period in, that we are currently at uh, in our uh, year, and also despite the enormously complex and uh, important yet very peculiar topic uh, of uh, today's uh, discussion. Uh, James Mahoney is proposing nothing less than a redefinition of the logic of social science. So there ought to be just one logic and just one social science. And uh, I know for a fact that this proposition and this position uh, is creating a lot of food for thought and discussion, and we will get a, a, a sort of impression of this today. The idea to organize the symposium occurred to us, the three discussants, Nancy Cartwright, Rosa Runhardt and Hilde van Mecklenburg, when all four of us attended a small workshop last year in Tilburg, and this workshop was on was entitled Learning from Case Studies. And more than once during the discussion, Jim's new book was brought uh, uh, you know, uh, into the discussion, and uh, strong feelings, both pro and con, uh, were involved when, when discussing, and we thought we should confront the uh, author directly with our strong feelings about about his work. So uh, before we go immediately, please allow me to introduce the, briefly the uh, speakers. Uh, James uh, Mahoney is Gordon Falcher Professor in Decision Making of both Sociology and Political Science. And he is one of the leading scholars in social science methodology with a qualitative bent. And uh, until recently, I would have added positivist qualitative methodology, but uh, as will become clear, Today, with his newest book, uh, James is attempts, attempts to reconcile interpretivist and positivist versions of uh, the social science. Jim has received various awards and, and published, unsurprisingly, in the best uh, uh, journals and outlets uh, of the disciplines. Um, so far, my reading of Jim's work was that the, he proposes set theory and Boolean algebra as the unifying framework for qualitative social science. And uh, for what it is worth, I'm totally buying into this. So I will try to not have my bias uh, influence my moderating role today. But with his recent book, he goes one step further and claims that uh, all social sciences ought to be based on sets and uh, their relations. And this is so because all concepts uh, that we are interested in as social scientists are uh, um, socially constructed and therefore best captured as sets. So I think this is the, uh, the one of the essences of the books, which we will discuss and uh, critically discuss. Uh, Nancy Cartwright uh, is professor of philosophy at Durham University and a distinguished mm -hmm. professor at the University of California in San Diego. Uh, Nancy but is yeah. considered one of one of the most oh influential. Uh, there are some microphones turned on. If you could turn them off, uh, some participants. So Nancy Cartwright is considered one of the most influential and important living philosophers of. Uh, science. She has held numerous positions in the prestigious places from Stanford to LSE, Maryland, and visiting positions in many more such places. And her uh, publication record is uh, uh, sort of eye-watering and, and with many extremely influential writings, among them uh, maybe the most uh, best known uh, 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 book is entitled How the Laws of Physics Lie. Rosa Runhardt is Assistant Professor of Philosophy of Mind and Language at Radboud University in the Netherlands. Uh, she is an analytic philosopher of science with a specialization in philosophy of causation and philosophy of social science. And in the past year, Rosa has become uh, well known among the crowd of qualitative social scientists who aim uh, at bringing systematized standards into qualitative methods, often by relying on set theory uh, and Boolean algebra. Last but not least, Hilde van Mecklenburg is Assistant Professor of International Relations at the Institute of Political Science at Leiden University. And since now several years, many years, Hilde is an active contributor to the discussions on process tracing as a method for drawing descriptive 
in causal inferences and uh, is uh, delivering courses uh, in the best known uh, and major method school uh, around Europe on this methodology. Now, uh, some organizational matters, uh, um, just briefly. First of all, this meeting is recorded. For those who don't want to be uh, seen, okay, that's not difficult for you. You have to sort of cover your face. The online crowd, in general, I would ask you to keep the camera and microphone off. And if you want to contribute in the discussion, please raise your virtual hand on Zoom uh, and or post the question in the chat. And then when given the floor, please uh, turn on the camera if you're fine with recording. If not, then leave the camera off uh, and maybe ask the question only in the, in the chat. And the sequence will be such. 50 minutes to Jim to provide the context, then each uh, discussant has 20 minutes, and afterwards we have an open floor debate which is kicked off by Jim responding to the uh, uh, comments he will have received by that point of time. And I try to really stick to the 15 minutes. Uh, uh, I will even have a stopwatch. I sort of make myself hurt uh, if you sort of approach the 15 or then 20 minutes. Okay, Jim, over to you. Thank you so much, Karsten. Um, I'm delighted to participate in this event. Uh, thank you also to Nancy and, and Hilde and, and Rosa for for discussing my book. I'm I'm honored to have you as as discussants, really, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to your comments. I'll try to provide a short overview of the philosophical aspects of the book, and I'm going to share my screen at this point. Okay, um, the uh, uh, the book has uh, in part one a philosophical discussion. In part two of the book, it's it's focused on methodological tools for enacting uh, the the approach developed in part one. And in part three, it focuses on on developing theory that's consistent with with this approach. I think the discussion today will mainly center on on part one, which concerns primarily ontology. Uh, recently, uh, just yesterday, I believe, Philosophy of Social Science published online uh, a version that summarizes the philosophical uh, argument. Uh, I think Karsten will post these slides in the chat, uh, so I'm not gonna dwell on them. Uh, the basic argument uh, of the book, at least in part one, is that the social sciences need a solution to the problem of essentialism, that scientific constructivism offers this solution, and that set theoretic analysis is a way to implement scientific constructivism in practice. Uh, essentialism or psychological essentialism, uh, as I uh, use the term, is a built-in bias in which we understand the world as consisting of entities that possess inner essences. And those inner essences endow the entities with a certain identity and a certain nature or certain tendencies. Here's a quote from Susan Gelman, whose book, The Essential Child, profoundly influenced me. She writes, essentialism is a pervasive, persistent reasoning bias that affects human categorization in profound ways. It is deeply ingrained in our conceptual systems, emerging at a very young age across highly varied cultural contexts. Essentialism is a species general, universal, inevitable mode of thought. Essentialism grounds our inductive inferences about the objects and entities around us. We cannot help but assume that a shared essence causes category members to exhibit certain natures, certain tendencies. Essentialism is a false description of social reality and social categories. And this conclusion is I derive from a large experimental literature in psychology uh, and social science. Uh, our social categories do not in fact possess inner essences that give them their identity and that give them an inherent nature or inherent tendencies. A natural kind, a natural kind uh, does have uh, 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 internal essences and a certain uh, uh, nature. A natural kind is a collection of entities that share mind-independent essences, essences that do not depend on us, that endow them with a certain nature. An example would be the chemical elements. Our social categories are not natural kinds. Our social categories do not track or map natural kinds. 
Our social categories do not carve nature at its joints. Our social categories depend on us. They depend on our collective understandings for their existence and for their efficacy. And examples of social categories are all the main categories that are used uh, at least in macro and meso level uh, social science, democratic regime, development, revolution. Uh, in the book, I don't have time to go over it here, but in the book, I distinguish between natural kinds, human kinds, which is the main basis of the social sciences, and partial natural kinds. And uh, they differ in the degree of mind independence, the degree to which they're stable over space and time, and whether or not they have inherent causal powers. And I give different examples of, of these uh, of uh, three types. I think one goal of science uh, is to uh, uh, help elucidate the degree to which an entity is a natural kind versus a human kind. And uh, I see science as that's one of its major goals. Is depression, for example, a natural kind uh, or a human kind? Currently, psychologists are divided on that question, and there's good research uh, taking place on that issue. Social science categories like democratic regime refer to entities that are composed of natural kinds. However, these entities are heterogeneous in their natural kind composition. So democratic regime, yes, the category refers to stuff out there in the world, natural kinds in the world. But two democratic regimes need not share uh, similar natural kind compositions, and their similarities in natural kind composition are not what make them democratic regimes. Social categories lack a one-to-one -one correspondence with natural kinds. I believe that natural kinds do exist. I make that argument in the book. I, I wouldn't stake my life on it. Um, I especially believe that our best scientific theories identify at least approximate natural kinds. And I think that that's why natural science works, is because natural scientists are tapping into the natural kinds of, of reality and at least approximating them in their best models. Uh, I'm a scientific essentialist with respect to the natural sciences. Uh, Brian Ellis's book, Scientific Essentialism, I think he's uh, essentially correct for the natural sciences. I'm a scientific constructivist with respect to the social sciences. And is what I advocate is local constructivism rather than global constructivism. Constructivism for, the, for social categories, not for natural kinds. Uh, some features of nearly all important social science concepts they depend on human understandings for their existence. The entities to which they refer are heterogeneous in their natural kind composition, and they lack inherent dispositions and they're not part of any law of nature. Democratic country. You know, we can define this category, of course, but our definition will not refer to any natural kinds or mind independent entities. We'll define the category using other social categories and we can go on and on but our, this process of definitional elaboration, it's not going to bottom out in any natural kinds. A massive referential disconnect exists between social science categories and natural kinds of the world. By contrast, I think the standard model of particle physics does not have a massive referential disconnect with natural kinds. One implication of scientific constructivism the homogeneity assumptions required for the Rubin, Holland, Woodward counterfactual model of, of causal inference, also known as the potential outcomes framework, are always radically violated with social categories. Another implication of scientific constructivism would be that most of the quantitative work in economics is built on false assumptions. That, that work requires homogeneity assumptions that, in fact, are violated with social categories. Uh, science demands that, that, at least social science demands that we live with a certain conflict. We have to embrace an understanding of social reality that does not correspond to how we experience it. We experience entities as having essences. Set theoretic analysis. One of the moves I make is to redefine the category set. The standard definition of set is a collection of entities that all share one or more properties in common, and I call those property sets. The properties of an entity come first under the standard definition. 
And it's what the set is. It's just a way of grouping together entities that already share something in common. The property set definition, it's basic to our essentialist thinking. And I think it's very useful for natural kinds. Natural kinds are property sets. They share an essence and that makes them members of a, of a natural kind. I want to use the definition of set in which a set is a bounded location in space in which entities can have membership. So a set is a, a boundary within space in which entities can have membership, including partial membership. I call this alternative definition a spatial set. A spatial set is prior to its members. Entities are similar because they share membership in the spatial set, not because they share any pre-existing properties. Entities are similar or different because of their membership in spatial sets. Where we draw the boundary for the spatial set determines whether entities are similar or different. With something like democratic national regime, I can redraw the boundary and include case G so that suddenly it's a democratic national regime. The boundary of the set determines the uh, identity of the entities. Um, the boundaries of a spatial set, normally we define them using other sets. So we, we might define democratic national regime as the intersection of free elections, universal suffrage, and, and broad civil rights. And we can situate cases in relationship to those three sets. These are all social categories. These categories don't have any special referential connection with natural kinds. Sets, where are they located? They're located in the mind's representational system. And we can think of it as a kind of hyperspace. Sets are the conceptual spaces of geometric spatial models of mental content. Conceptual spaces in our mind, they're forged from our interaction with the natural world. They're carved out from experience. I think probably genetically we're designed to develop certain kinds of conceptual spaces when exposed to the natural world, but most of them we learn from interaction with the world. Our social science categories, our social categories are spatial sets. They're, they're conceptual spaces of the mind. They refer to heterogeneous and mostly uncomprehended natural entities in the world, but it's the category membership that makes those heterogeneous entities similar. So how do we carry out social science? One, we, we treat all categories as spatial sets that exist in our mind. All categories are sets. We establish the boundaries of the sets on the basis of semantics within particular communities. We either use existing uh, uh, understandings of boundaries or we create our own and share that with our readers. We then objectively explore set relations using set theoretic analysis and QCA. And, and uh, that's uh, the science part comes in in step three. Uh, we derive causal findings by identifying regularities and set relations. And so I advocate for social categories, not for natural kinds, but for social categories, a regularity theory of causality. And finally, our, our findings are relative to a particular semantic context. If we change the boundaries of our categories, if we change what we mean by our categories, our propositions change and we, we don't have the same findings. An example of this kind of work, I think at least implicitly, would be Reagan and Fiss's book, Intersectional Inequality. And I'll just conclude with a slide on some of their uh, findings. I'm not going to go over all of these, but if, here's one of their findings. Number one, individuals with membership in the category white person have a greater number of causal pathways to not in poverty than individuals with membership in the category black person. These are the kinds of findings that I see social science as, as elucidating. Obviously, this finding means depends on what we mean by white person, black person, and not in poverty person. Uh, I will stop there as in, with my 15 minute overview. Thank you very much. That is uh, three minutes ahead of time. Uh, thank you. Um, that was very helpful, I hope. And we follow the order uh, in which I sent out the program, which means Nancy, the floor would be yours now. Um, so I was particularly interested in this book when um, I learned more about it at the conference because um, being a philosopher of social science, I thought uh, it was derelict if I didn't immediately get on to um, a book that was 
uh, telling me the logic of social science. Uh, so that's why that's um, uh, turned into red there. So what I'm gonna do today is I want to query uh, Jim Mahoney um, you know, to, to say more in defense of some of his views because I'm a bit puzzled um, and I'm gonna come to these queries by um, defending first equations, which he doesn't like, and variables. And just a second, there's something in the middle of my screen so I can actually see it myself. Equations, variables, and social properties or social entities. So <clears throat> why is it the uh, logic of social science according to Jim Mahoney? By the way, um, we don't only read the book, but we actually met for two days at my house and really worked through this. So this is one of the questions that I think uh, Hilda, uh, Hilde uh, raised. Why is it the uh, logic of social science? Uh, well, I think that's, as I read, uh, and just heard, I think, uh, what Mahoney says is when you do social science, you are doing sets, even if you don't know it. Now me, what I, how I feel about this is, even if it's true, this does not count against variables and equations. So you wouldn't be surprised if I say this having been brought up not only on set theory, but on uh, equations. So. My, my first observation is that we simply do have a more sophisticated construct, conceptual structures to use than just sets like all of mathematics. And that was actually one of the things that my uh, mentor, Pat Supis, um, had said about the attempts to axiomatize um, and without uh, allowing oneself the, the language of mathematics. Okay. So, um, and yes, I think there's a venerable insight in the argument, in the argument for sets, okay? um, but I don't think that the insight supports Mahoney's distinction between natural and social properties, nor the rejection of object property ontology, nor the rejection of variables to represent the quantities in the ontology. So, what, a, what alternative to sets as equations? So here's a typical equation that we might see in um, econometrics or in uh, defending the use of a randomized controlled trial. It looks like a potential outcome equation. <laughs> now, what I, the point I want to start out with is that Venn diagrams are equivalent to Boolean propositions. That is, you know, A and B or C and D and E or dot, dot, dot. So Venn diagrams are equivalent to Boolean propositions. And those are equivalent to equations with dichotomous variables where the AIs that are in my equation there are equal to one. So there we have a translation from a simple uh, Boolean proposition uh, to uh, uh, expressing the same thing in dichotomous variables. Now, fuzzy Venn diagrams look to me to be just equations with multi-value variables. And again, AI equals one. So uh, if you are, if, if you've assigned that something sort of has 25% set membership 50, 75, that's just like having a variable has a value 0 0.25, 0 0.5, uh, et cetera. Okay, and equations. So we've, we've got the, anything you can do with sets, I can do with equations. And so far, I mean, if you just have equations with um, multi-value variables and AI equals one, you, know, um, you can do any, set theory can do anything I can do with my equation. But the thing is, um, equations can do more because equations can represent how the degree of set membership maps onto a degree of set membership. So it's, it's not always as if you're sort of once sure that the, 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 the thing that I, I know QCA people are really concerned about, which is sufficiency, you know, so you put things decide maybe at the 50% uh, cut off that it, it, you're going to count that as being in the set. And then, then you ask whether being in that set is sufficient for being in another set. But there's often much more sophisticated um, facts and more sophisticated information available, such as being a quarter way into this set means that you're a quarter way into that set. And that information is easily recorded by using equations. So what the A's represent is how much a unit of membership and xi contributes to the degree of membership in z. So 
Okay, <laughs> given, given that um, what's wrong with variables, that's my question. I just don't see what's wrong with variables. Variables can do all that sets can do. Okay. Now, uh, Mahoney says that variables, I don't know, I'm not quite sure whether they lead us to essentialize or, I mean, they're certainly not in any way uh, definitionally or conceptually bound up with essentializing. Um, okay. So, um, I'm just going to repeat what we've just heard. Essentializing is seeing the world as consisting of entities that possess inner essences, which endow the entities with an identity and a certain nature with identities and tendencies. So me, well, I just don't know. I, I mean, I don't know about inner essences. Uh, I never did understand them when I uh, was made to take metaphysics courses, um, but, you know, what about things with properties, whether they have inner essences or not? Yes. Um, I can't see any argument against things with properties. And for social science, these are very often social things with social properties. Okay. Um, now, Mahoney claims that natural kind things with natural properties are in the world, but social properties aren't. Well, what's wrong? real social features and the variables that represent them. Uh, so Nick, okay, um, these are category labels. Uh, and they pick up real features of real things in the real world. So democracy um, is a feature of real countries or not, and it might only be a degree. I would represent it by a variable myself, uh, your degree of democracy. Um, okay, so category labels, pick out uh, real features of real things that we represent with variables. And, and I think variables do just what Mahoney says they do. Um, they reflect whether or the extent to which units possess particular properties. Um, now, Mahoney says, I say category labels pick out real properties of real things. And he says they mark up memberships in sets in our heads or in conceptual spaces, but the conceptual spaces are in our heads or minds or I'm not sure. Okay, so keep calm, it's all in your head. Now why, what's, what's the argument for that? Um, well, I wanna note, I, don't, I hope Hilde is gonna talk about this. It was one of the things that uh, we talked about a lot uh, with her is all concepts are socially constructed. Okay. So whether they're a natural kind Natural property, the concept of an electron, uh, the concept of a horse, these are all socially constructed. Okay. And of course, social science studies, entities, who's it, and, and so first the thing is all concepts are socially constructed. So I'm very happy that social science concepts are. And secondly, I'm also happy to admit that social science studies, entities whose existence depends on collective understandings. Okay. Um, that's fine. But that doesn't imply that these entities and features aren't in the world. They depend on, uh, they were created by us, and we have, it takes a shared understanding for many of them to, uh, to keep them in existence and being the kinds of things they are with the abilities to do the kinds of things they do. Um, so I don't, this, but admitting that the existence depends on collective understanding doesn't mean that they, that they don't exist. Um, and um, to also to claim that we should study features of reality as an experience by communities does not imply that we are not studying features of reality. Um, we're studying the features of reality um, that we care about, as Max Weber said, and also as, as experience, but you know, in natural science, we're also studying features of reality uh, as experienced by us, by communities, okay. So why must we be doing sets in our heads? And now I'm gonna reconstruct what I thought, um, you know, how I understood the, the, the picture to go. So this is my reconstruction of Mahoney. Um, and I think about it, do it by thinking about a, a simple proper name predicate claim, like the UK is a democracy or for illustration, Nancy's windbreaker is red. Okay. I'll contrast what a property object view says we are doing with what, according to Mahoney, we are doing, or at least according to Mahoney as I understand it. 
So uh, <clears throat> we think okay, what, what, what Mahoney I, tells us is um, we mistakenly I think we are spying into the world. Okay. Um, when we move around and see things and put labels on things and make claims about the world. So we think we are spying into the world and we think that we're doing something like making a color match. So we're looking out there in the world, we're looking to see whether the, you know, Nancy's windbreaker is red, we're looking at Nancy, we've got a, a, a paradigm of a color red patch and we're trying to see if, um, if the two match. Uh, that's what we think that, that he says that sort of is our understanding he says is what we think we're doing but what we're really doing is we produce a bunch of boxes but we produce the boxes in our heads and then we arrange them in some order and i do want to allow that you know there are new boxes we might add as we go along and we might stick new labels on things um, or change the shapes of the boxes. Um, and often we've got a box. What you're doing in social science is often trying to find out what the relations among these boxes are, um, which doesn't quite fit with the story I just heard. Anyway, uh, and, and according to Pony, further still in our heads, what we do, we're doing in our heads, is uh, we put name tags <coughs> into those boxes. So we're not actually spying into the world and matching a color uh, with an object there. Instead, what we're doing is we're taking the name tag that we've invented, Nancy, uh, or Nancy's windbreaker, and putting it into the category, the box we've called, has the label red on it. So, as I understand it, we, the claim is we are doing sets because that's all we can do. I mean, all we have is this conceptual space. Now, this is similar to standard philosophic doctrine, so I don't quite understand why this, how, how, it, how it differs. Um, and that's going to matter because, um, okay, um, this is similar to Kant on the phenomenal world versus the noumenal world. We live in the phenomenal world, all we ever experience is the phenomenal world. We have our concepts, we don't experience the world, uh, the noumenal world at all, though there might is a noumenal world which. Um, okay, is somehow regulates uh, the, the phenomenal world. It's also similar to the Vienna Circle arguments that you know we should be abandoning the correspondence theory of truth, you know, where we think that the word Nancy corresponds to Nancy out there in the real world, not in our phenomenal world. Um, and uh, the Vienna Circle arguments to abandon correspondence theory of truth in favor of coherence. And then for those of you who know it, Hillary Putnam's argument that if we were brains in a vat, that's sort of like the matrix, we wouldn't be able to say that truly. And that's because we have, all, we have no way to refer to that real vat outside our experience. And if we're talking about vats in our experience, we sure ain't in any. So now my claim is that that argument doesn't support a distinction between natural and social properties. Both live in the phenomenal world. And I agree, as Mahoney says, social scientists need a basic model of categorization that is both consistent with the brain process underlying representation and capable of informing actual social science research. I agree with that. But that's equally true of natural science, that if, if a basic model of categorization that's consistent with the brain process is underlying representation. And if that's the brain process is underlying representation, which I'm perfectly happy that, um, that we, um, we bring to the world these uh, uh, concepts into which, uh, in which we um, experience it and describe it. Okay. So that doesn't, anyway, the point is that argument does, doesn't seem to me to support a distinction between natural and social properties nor a rejection of an object property ontology. And the world that we experience, we experience objects with properties. We succeed very well with that ontology in both natural and social science. And, um, I, I think many of you folks can make fairly good predictions in some cases. Um, and my claim is that you, know, you, are, <clears throat> you are thinking of democracies as you know, countries with certain features. And variables are a good way to represent the amount of a property an object exhibits. Um, 
And if we're thinking of that, as I said, we may often, uh, a la Karsten, see, um, see the amount the amount of a property and object exhibits as the distance that that feature an object has is from the ideal type of that feature. So finally, okay. yes, I agree entirely. And I think there are good arguments to say that social objects are created by society and they need a shared understanding to sustain them. Um, I agree, we create them, but I think this is a very important lesson to go away with. Vico was wrong. We don't understand them just because we create them. Um, they do, once they're created, have a life of their own. There are all sorts of institutional structures that we created um, and have rather unpleasant, unexpected side effects. So they have a life of their own. And it is a life social science should be coming to understand. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's already a lot on our plate, uh, Jim, mostly for you, but there will be two more to go. Uh, Rosa, I pass the floor to you and then Hilde. Okay, you should be able to see my slide now. Oh, for some reason, I, we don't see you, uh, it's, you know, we don't see it on the big screen. I can see those who are online can see it. And that's uh, ah. sort of... Uh, <laughs> that's an interesting one. Yeah, it happened when I was logged out for just a second. Um, there was some internet connection. I don't know how this is possible, but why don't you go ahead and I try to figure it out and we imagine what you are saying. I mean, sure. I can look at my screen here. Okay, that's that's perfect. Well, well thank you very much. We'll get to the meeting. So, um, um, so uh, thanks again for inviting me, Carson. It's very nice. Um, I was so lucky to be able to discuss the book in advance, not just with Nancy and Hilda, as Nancy said, but also with Jim. So. I'm hoping to bring a little bit of structure, middle ground to the disagreements that I've noticed there. And so today what I'll discuss is what I believe the consequences are of taking a scientific constructivist position, in particular for causal inquiry. And in particular, I will discuss to what extent and in what sense social constructivist causal inquiry can then be said to be a relativist. And I'll define those terms uh, as we go on. All right, so one of the strong elements in the book, and I think we heard that from Nancy just now, is that it defends the contingency of social categories, such as democratic regime, being economically developed, social class, and so on. And so in this talk, what I will do is outline what this contingency looks like for a scientific constructivist. And then I'll draw out some potential dilemmas for scientific constructivism, which centers on this causal inquiry question. So to start, what I'll do is discuss scientific constructivism and set membership values as I've read the book. I'm really hoping for Jim to correct me if I make mistakes there, of course. And then I will turn to consequences for causal inquiry. I'll discuss what to make of Jim's claims that causal regularities are relative to semantic communities. And I will do this with an illustration of just one of the many diagrams in Jim's book. And then finally, I will draw out what I've called the relativist dilemma. So my argument in short is that making regularities relative to semantic communities leads to a stronger relativism than Jim may want. And what I will do is discuss my own preferred way out of the dilemma. And of course, I look forward to hearing your point of view, all three of you in the discussion. All right, so let's start. As I read the book in Scientific Constructivism, set descriptions are what I call contingent as a philosopher of language, philosopher of science. So social objects are created by society, and that means that how one defines the boundaries of a set, like democratic regimes, as we've just seen, depends on the linguistic semantic community one is in. So for example, the meaning of democracy is relative to the semantics of a given community, like political scientists in the US might differ in their meaning of democracy from World Bank policymakers who may differ from politicians in China and so on. And now this position, I take it, is uncontroversial among philosophers. And there's some recent work, I think it fits quite well with what Nancy and I have written a few years ago about measurement in the social sciences. Um, it fits quite well with Anna Alexandrova's view on thick measurement, measurement of concepts that both have a descriptive and a normative element to them. And so we have argued, as have I think a lot of um, uh, philosophers, that due to the complexity of the social world, there's no single right way of dividing the world into categories. And you can take 
complexity here in all kinds of different senses. I think it depends on the topic that we're uh, faced with. So this means that there's no single right way of giving, say, necessary and sufficient conditions for which countries are democratic and which ones aren't. Uh, you need to make those choices based on your purpose, your values, your theories, etc. So I take scientific constructivism to be a version of those claims, but applied in the context of set theoretic methods. And now, as a consequence of that contingency of conceptualization, in scientific constructivism, there is no overarching community independent way of determining set membership as well. So for instance, whether Hungary say is a member of the set of democratic regimes depends on our contingent delineation of that set. All right. So now what I'd like to do is reconstruct a concrete example of this contingency by asking how then do the scientific constructivists define a set like economically developed countries? So let us assume for a moment that this is a fuzzy or a continuous set. So a given country can be wholly in the set or partially in and out of the set. Now, for a scientific constructivist, as I understand Jim, um, this setting a value of membership in that set may involve several things. And one of them is quantitative data. So for instance, if you start from the linguistic community of experts working at the World Bank, you can use their claims that countries are in the set depending on their GDP. For instance, you would have to determine for the World Bank what the 0 and 0 0.5 and 1 values are of membership in that set of economically developed countries. You could say something like, if you're over a certain GDP, you have value 1. If you're between two values, you have 0, 0 0.5 as value. And if you're under a certain GDP, then you're 0. Right? And I think Jim here refers to uh, Reagan's formulas for converting quantitative data to fuzzy sets. Those go way beyond what we can do in 20 minutes, so I'm going to leave that as there. Um, but that's how I read this. And so a second way of setting a value for set membership is what I will call here descriptive inferences. So in descriptive inferences, you first decide whose ideas about economic development you care about, and you then start to do some actual research to find out how they would set these membership values. So for instance, you ask a group of experts directly which countries they consider to be economically developed, which are not, and which are sort of in the middle, right? Based on what the term then means in that community, you can set that in membership. You can set those membership values. And this also means that you don't have to refer necessarily to you know, your World Bank. You could also be interested in the lived experience of people, say, on benefits in the EU, see how they determine economic development. So, so you could interview them. You can find out what their sets look like. And so in short, then economic development is only a meaningful category relative to a given linguistic community. So a group of social scientists, a group of experts, a group of people involved and so on and so forth. And you're trying to communicate with these people, which is why you use them to set those membership values. All right, so, so far, I think we've seen that the contingency of set membership observations has some consequences, right? For the evaluation of the truth, the findings about set membership. Very complicated way of saying that because the boundaries of sets are somewhat contingent, depend on the linguistic community, whether or not a particular unit, a country, a person, et cetera, is in that set is also dependent on the linguistic community. So whether that's true or false or halfway there depends on the linguistic community we're in, right? And this also has consequences for many of the methodological tools and explanatory tools in Jim's book. And I think that that's why the order of the book works quite well. So as Jim himself puts it, the truth of a finding depends on the theories, models, and categories that are used to understand the workings of objective reality or experiential reality. So of all the aspects of the book that we could consider now and draw consequences out for, I will only limit myself to asking, what are the consequences of this contingency of sets and set membership for causal inquiry? All right. So, as Jim argues, scientific constructivism focuses special attention on the identification of causal regularities within particular semantic communities. So it seems, again, that the contingency of set membership extends to some kind of contingency of causal conclusions, causal inquiry. And let's investigate what this looks like with an example. 
All right. So here's figure 3.13 from the book. Uh, imagine we are investigating two sets, X and Y. So you can see here, I think I'm going to try and use my laser pointer, see if that worked, there we go. Um, so we can see here that on the Y axis, we are plotting the membership value of particular units, right? The unit could be here, for instance. We're plotting the uh, value of membership in Y and on the X axis, the value of membership in X. Um, so for instance, what we might be doing, just turning off my um, laser pointer again, if I can, there we go. Uh, we might be interested in these two sets, elite rivalry and non-guerrilla geno genocide. So um, I'm borrowing this example from uh, Steph Haggard and Gary Gertz, just because I met them a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they take it from Van der Maat. Happy to share the references, but I'm sure you uh, are most of most of you are familiar with this. So in that particular example, our x-axis will describe the set membership value of a given country in elite rivalry. Right, and zero there will be um, there's none. Right, very simple, and one being that there is. And since this is a continuous plot, there are also going to be some intermediate values, uh, intermediary values possible. And the y-axis then will show us to what extent the unit is in non-guerrilla genocide. And the values of X and Y are going to be set membership values. So remember for the social constructivist, these values will depend on the linguistic community's delineation of what elite rivalry is as a set and what non-guerrilla genocide is as a set. So imagine that at one point in time, a linguistic community has decided to place one country here, right? So there's a medium level of elite rivalry, membership in non guerrilla genocide is relatively low. However, a different community, which I'll denote with blue, has decided instead, they disagree because of their set definitions and they place the same country here, right? If this now happens to a sufficient number of countries, right? Imagine that your red community has done it like this, but your blue community is over here. For that second blue community, X, it seems, is no longer just a necessary cause for Y, as it was for the red community, but it seems now to be close to a necessary and sufficient cause for Y. Okay. I think this example is helpful because it allows us to see in practice what is going to be the consequence of being um, a scientific constructivist or a social constructivist about these things. All right, so in other words, whether X is a necessary or sufficient cause for Y is going to be dependent on the linguistic community. Uh, we've seen that by playing around with how we set a set membership value, we are able to change cases position in the scatter plot from let's say above to below the line or from below the line to on the line, et cetera. And because of this dependence on the linguistic community, I started to wonder, should we now be relativists about causal inquiry? And Jim, of course, has picked this up himself, and he makes the following distinction um, between two interpretations of this relativism. One, uh, and this is in philosopher's terms, but one might be that causal claims are true or false relative to the community they are uttered by because the terms change reference. The other might be, and I'll explain this in a bit, that the same causal claim with the same reference of terms changes truth value from one community to the other. All right, so I'm going to explain all, both of these and I'll explain which one I think Jim is in and then a third alternative. So as I read his work and following the example that I gave just now, it seems that Jim agrees with number one here. We saw a case of switching, right? For one community, X was a necessary cause of Y, for another, it was necessary and sufficient. Why was this? Because the terms, elite rivalry, for instance, changed reference. They changed their meaning. I don't want to go into the whole philosophy of language and the whole analytic tradition and meaning and reference and so on. Let's not do that here, maybe later. Um, but I think that that's an important point, right? So here's a quote that illustrates uh, my interpretation. So Jim writes that the implication is that a proposition requires a particular semantic context in order to embody a certain meaning and exist as a certain kind of proposition. Outside of this context, the proposition carries a different meaning and is not the same proposition. And this illustrates, I think, what Jim might call a sort of moderate version of relativism, right? 
Um, another version of this moderate relativism in the book is his insistence on what he calls epistemological objectivity. This only occurs a couple of times in the book and in the scientific constructivist framework, it means roughly the following, right? The results of an analysis should in principle be reproducible and subject to empirical verification in subsequent work by different researchers. I know you take this, take it that this is what makes it objective in a sense, right? Um, to define this more formally, results are going to be epistemologically objective if a single right answer exists about the truth of a proposition within a community of individuals who share a semantic context. So as long as everyone agrees on the terms, we are able to reproduce the results. But this does require that you're in the same linguistic community or pretend to be in the same linguistic community as the people you're trying to reproduce the results from, right? Uh, so the different researchers in this quotation seem to be researchers who share the same semantic community or pretend to do anyway. All right. Now, despite all these claims that seem moderate, I think that the relativism in scientific constructivism is still quite strong. So we've seen that making set membership relative to linguistic communities makes the truth of causal claims relative to linguistic communities as well. And we saw this in the scatter plot example. Now, even Jim's attempts at epistemological objectivity, though, seem to go against intuition in several ways. Right? And the first is what I call agreement across communities. So we have the intuition, I do at least, that whether or not, let's say, democracy increases risk of war or elite rivalry necessarily leads to genocide is not something you can only judge relative to a limited group of experts. Uh, you would hope, I would think, that everyone can go along with the arguments made. I would argue that most people believe that there are some good reasons for certain categorizations, right? Not just in a given community, but across them for our social world. Even if some countries' membership in a set of democracies is quite vague, there are going to be definite examples that should always be in. And should is very normative here, right? We think that there's a correct way of categorizing certain uh, units. So another way that it goes against our intuition is that I think we implicitly consider that lived experts or experts, let's think back to those World Bank people, must be consulted because they have some kind of special epistemic status, right? They must be consulted to determine the set boundaries and set membership, not just any man on the street, right? So we do not treat all linguistic communities as equal. In some, I think there seem to be some objective reasons behind categorization that are crossing communities. So where can this come from in Jim's scientific constructivism? This I think leads to what I call the relativist dilemma. Right? So either we're going to be more extreme relativists about causation, right? When I think that for some communities, elite rivalry leads to non-guerrilla genocide and in others it does not, and there's no fact of the matter at all given the world around us. Any linguistic community can and should be consulted, right? You can ask a man on the street, you can ask a political scientist, you can ask, and so on, and so on. Or the other extreme, we admit that there are some stabilizing factors in judging the truth of causal claims, right? That way you could explain these commonalities between linguistic communities. You'd, you could explain your preference for certain expert communities or communities of people who have a lived experience you ground their claim somewhere. Now, it might well be that, and I think that this is true, that this dilemma is resolved differently for different categories in the social world, right? It might be that for certain categories, we just need to be extremely relativist, almost skeptical, and for others, we are going to think that there are these stabilizing factors. For those categories that we do consider to have stabilizing factors, I don't see where they come from in Jim's framework yet. So the easiest answer that I can think of is that these commonalities across communities would come from the real world, right? Real conflict, real actors, real actions, etc. But then, as Nancy said, are those not entities with features that are in the world? So this is what I would like to pick uh, Jim's brain about, and I'd be really interested to hear more about. So in conclusion, just to sum up, I've argued that a right answer exists by the truth of causal claims, but only relative to a community of individuals who share a semantic context. That is the claim, I think, in this um, 
uh, in this book. Yet, we act as if some communities are privileged and find non-random agreement across communities uh, quite appealing. And this brings up some relativist dilemma that means that either we become extreme relativists about causal claims, we let in any kind of um, setting, set membership values, setting your um, position on the scatter plot, etc., or we admit that there are some stabilizing factors, but I can't find them in the book. All right, thank you. Great, thank you, Rosa, also for this contribution. Hilde, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not have a PowerPoint, so I'm not going to share anything. I hope everybody can just follow me from uh, the discussion. Um, first, um, thanks, Carsten, also to you for organizing and hosting, and James for so very patiently listening to all our contemplations and reflections here. Um, I'm going to focus my discussion on the two elements of the book that are essentially closest to my own work and interests, and these are first, and Nancy kind of gave it away already, the particular constructivism of the book and the way you link it to the scientific, um, and on the other hand, the logic of social science, right, the set theoretic logic of social science um, in particular, but then also the fact that you propose a the logic of social science. Overall, um, I'll end up raising four concrete questions. But before I'm going to do this, um, I'd like to compliment the book and the tremendous effort that must have gone into writing it. So let me highlight some of the contributions I think it makes, also because it will allow me to situate my discussion. And since I'm not, I'm the third to discuss this, and you already gave your own introduction, I'm afraid there's going to be some elements that are going to be slightly repetitive. Um, but I'll just go with it because it kind of just um, kind of it's it's the flow of of how I thought about these things. So first, in line of complementing uh, the book, um, the way the book argues against the tendencies to essentialize in the social sciences, I actually think is incredibly valuable. So the book argues that in the social sciences, the things we study are constructs. Democracies, revolutions, primary education, capitalist economies, these are things that we humans group together on the basis of certain criteria and logics, right? This is where Nancy questioned, aren't these just things with properties? Um, and these criteria and logics, they could have been different and they often are different across time and space. And that's the constructivism in the scientific constructivism that the book puts forward. And as categories, as constructs, there's no essence or innate logic. What these categories have is what we ascribe to them. And I think that is very important to realize. Second, and at least as important, the book posits causation itself as such a category or construct. This means the book recognizes that causation does not have an essence or innate logic to it either. It can mean multiple things and what it means concretely in any spatial temporal setting is dependent on the collective understanding of the community of reference, right? This is what uh, Rosa just explained and illustrated. Um, and it applies to, to the category of causation. Now, for me, this argument is important because it would allow for an honestly pluralist social science, a social science that recognizes that both the in-depth contextually embedded investigation of the ethnographer, but also the decontextualized quantified regressions of the statistician and everything in between has value. However, I'll come back to this point because I actually think the book somewhat undoes it. Uh, so, Preempting my critique, whilst I think the book correctly and importantly recognizes that causality itself is a construct, it ultimately also says, but I think we should all follow my construct because my construct is the correct construct. Um, and that I do have a bone to pick with. The final, at least for me, very welcome contribution of the book is that it explicitly argues that mechanisms are indispensable components of causal propositions. Causal propositions following the book should be supported by the study of mechanisms. And that I would simply like to accept as a very welcome contribution. However, um, and I will come back to this too, I do believe it raises some tensions with the essentially human understanding of causality the book puts forward. Um, briefly preempting this point as well, mechanisms have a study the token level of individual cases. Um, as the book also correctly recognizes. 
But regularities, at least as I see them, um, are type level cross case things. So what do I have beef with? As I said, I will focus my comments on two aspects of the book and I'll raise four specific questions. Starting with the first, scientific constructivism, what is there not to like? Two reflections. First, as I said, I think the overall trust is incredibly valuable. What we work with in the social sciences are constructs, things that we as a community define and calibrate, yeah, to, use a, to steal a term from, from QCA here. Now, the book calls these constructs conceptual spaces and subsequently locks them in the brain. Right? They are, I quote, entities that exist as conceptual spaces in the cognitive machinery of the mind. And the book then takes a tour through cognitive science, brain cells, and neural processes. And to a certain extent, I can understand this. If categories are constructs, it raises the difficult question of where then these constructs exist. And the book gives a clear answer in people's brains. Um, but I have two concerns with this move. First, it takes the social out of the constructivism. Constructs in the book become individual brain things. I will offer an alternative in a second, but the psychologization of constructs and constructivism makes it difficult, as the book does do, um, to link these brain things to linguistic communities. How do we go from individual brain things and neurons firing to shared conceptions? The book actually doesn't give an answer. Second, Making brain things, making constructs into brain things makes them relative to the individual brain circuits and configurations which, quote unquote, have been calibrated from previous experience. So kind of building on Rosa's argument just now that your argument is relative to linguistic communities, I would perhaps go one step further and say that making them into brain things makes these constructs relative to individual people and individual brain configurations. Uh, why does it make them relative in this way? Well, if we were to assume, and I don't think that would be an outrageous assumption uh, to make, that every person has had their own previous experiences, then every person should also have their own brain configuration. The conceptual spaces existing in the brain become individual cognitive creations dependent on the individual brain configurations. And ultimately, I, I don't believe that helps the argument. That's not what you're looking for. So, but if not in the brain, then where do constructs exist? Because as does the book, I do hold them to be real, so they must exist somewhere. My answer would be that constructs can be more fruitfully understood as existing in their expressions. Simply put, if constructs are what linguistic communities say they are, then it is in the saying, in the defining and the narrating um, that I would go looking for them. Focusing on constructs as narrative constructs would have the advantage first okay, of, yeah. not, sorry? of not needing to regress kind of to the, to the level of brains first. And um, second, I think having them as narrative constructs would allow you to understand them immediately at the level at which they're relevant and that's the fact that they are shared understandings. So we have shared narratives, shared construction, shared understandings. Um, so my first concrete question, I know this was a long run up to a single question, but now my first concrete question, um, why does the book make constructs brain things? What does the brain thing conceptualization afford that other conceptualizations would not? Second, um, I want to briefly reflect on what I think is ultimately a very thin understanding of constructivism that is put forward and the tensions that even then exist with the interpretation of the scientific. The constructivist element of the book begins and ends with the notion that, and I paraphrase, the categories of social scientific analysis explicitly embody the beliefs of the researcher, right? Democracy isn't an objective thing that we can touch, lift up, and, and kind of look at. Um, it is a construct that is defined, defined by a given community. Um, good, agreed, and I think we all do. But then the book, I quote, fully embraces realism and objective truth. We, social scientists, according to the book, must accept the transcendental notions of logic, truth and objectivity. And here I had to stop and think because it seems the book suggests that there is a single objective truth to truth and objectivity, 
that different from, say, democracy, truth and objectivity are factual, non-human constructed, innate, essential elements of science. And there I would disagree. And I also think it contradicts slightly the argument that the book makes. If things like democracy and wealth are human constructs, then so are truth and objectivity. And especially so is the place of truth and objectivity um, in science. In fact, the fact that the book, despite its constructivism, rehearses this narrative of truth and objectivism as hallmarks of science makes me wonder why it's so incredibly difficult to accept that human knowledge and understanding is always historically, temporally, and spatially contingent, always dependent on what we think we already know and how we interpret and make sense of our observations. And as Nancy just said, interpreting and sense-making in light of what we already know is not a description that applies to the social sciences only. It's a description of science per se. Right? Atoms and electrons may have a physical realness to them that democracy does not, but our knowledge of them is just as contingent and humanly constructed as our knowledge of social things. So my second concrete question, if we accept constructivism at the level of constructs, how can we retain an objective, truthful, non-constructed understanding of truth and objectivity and their role in the social sciences? Now, let me switch to what I see as the implicit, but then again, not so implicit, um, we've already talked about it, suggestion that set theory should be adopted by all social scientists as the logic of social science. Two more questions follow. Uh, starting with the logic itself, right? That the book combines set theory and set relations with a focus on mechanisms is something I very welcome. That's what I said in the beginning, I think, Yes, this is a way forward. It does so, however, in a way that makes me question what exactly is the underlying understanding of causation that the book works with. Let me explain. The book recasts mechanisms, at least recasts in terms of how I understood them previously, right? So it recasts mechanisms in terms of set relations. Rather than following a Mahama Darden and Craver kind of logic in which mechanisms are understood as entities engaging in activities, in the book, the analysis of a mechanism boils down to a researcher asking three questions. One, is the case a member of the set cause? Is the case a member of the set mechanism? And is the case a member of the set outcome? If all questions are answered yes, based on evidence, of course, um, a causal relation would be established. Now, in principle, this is coherent with two methodological propositions that the book puts forward. First, this understanding of mechanism as lower level set relations is coherent with the proposition that we should focus on the token level. As stated on page 77 and repeated elsewhere, the book is focused on token causality. And token causality concerns the causes of particular outcomes in specific cases. Second, this understanding of mechanisms is coherent with the argument that set theory is or should be the, the logic of social science. And I'm going to paraphrase something you said during an earlier uh, online panel at APSA. The implication of the book is qualitative researchers need to be explicitly and rigorously set theoretic. However, besides that this understanding of mechanisms as lower level set relations, in my opinion, uh, reduces the value added by qualitative in-depth case studies, what puzzles me is the explicit combination of the token level with a regularity understanding of causation. Because in the same chapter, the focus is placed on token causality, an essentially classic Jungian understanding of causality is added. Um, this Jungian understanding focuses on temporal succession, spatial temporal contiguity, and constant conjunctions. For all I know, that's classic Jungian uh, uh, causality. So, and actually, just now, right, during your presentation just now, you explicitly stated that we can derive causal findings by identifying, by identifying regularities in set relations. So that the, the point was that we should use regularity theory of causality. Now, going back to the, the propositions, um, 
the Jungian understanding, these three elements of a human understanding, Jungian understanding of causality, for number one and two, I can see that at the token level. Uh, and that's where we have these type of set theoretic single case mechanisms. But the third, the constant conjunction, the actual regularity can, I believe at least, never be a token level observation, right? We would always need multiple cases, multiple instances of a relation to study irregularity. So my third question, um, and this is really a very basic question, essentially, um, what is your understanding of causation? If it is token level set theoretic mechanisms, then how do regularities and constant conjunctions fit in there? And if it is regularities and constant conjunctions, then what is the added value of the focus on token level mechanisms? And I'm not saying here there is none, right? I'm not saying that mechanisms and regularities cannot be complementary, that we cannot hold a more pluralist understanding of causation, which in fact I do, but I'm saying it's non-obvious. And the book does not explicate how mechanisms and token level causation are combined with regularities in union constant conjunctions. And that gets me to my final uh, reflection and question. As I said in the beginning, I think the book rightfully points out that causation itself is a construct. It's a human kind in your terms. Um, causation does not have an innate meaning or natural essence. In fact, I think the, 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 the existence of the book and the conversation we're having right now show that we, as scholarly community, define causation. And that it's relative, coming back to Rosa's uh, argument, that it's relative to how we understand causation in the end. So the definition and our understanding of causation is temporally and spatially contingent. Personally, I find this argument important because it will allow for a truly pluralist social science, a social science in which we recognize that causation is not necessarily one thing or the other, or co-constitution, or mechanisms, or regularities, or probability racers, but that it can have diverse manifestations, and that the different methods we employ allow us to make visible some aspect, some feature of that overall beast that is our world. Yet, the book does not practice what it preaches. Ultimately, what the argument boils down to is another suggestion of causal monism, just with a different understanding of causation, just this time, not with statistics and probabilities, but with set theory. Now, ironically, Nancy, who did not really bring this point up herself, I would say, um, is actually one of the people who's persistently been arguing against such a monistic understanding of causation and science. So, and here I'm just going to cite from her 1999 book, The Dappled World. Um, she notes, the mistake, it seems to me, is to think that there is any such thing as the causal relationship for which we could provide a set of search procedures. Causation, and now I'm back to my own words, um, is elusive. And I think both science and the world would be better served if we would recognize that all our methods are faulty to some extent, but that they come with particular strengths that capture particular things well. Set theory, I would say, is particularly well suited um, to study conditional and complex regularities. That is to say, it has its virtues. But it ultimately also reduces the wealth of information and observations that we do have um, to binary set relations. And that is simply a pity. Um, so coming to my fourth and final question, if causality is truly a construct without essence or innate logic, why argue all social science should do one thing and why is that thing set theory? That were my comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hilde. Uh, Jim, you now have the impossible task to respond to all and each and every uh, point. And you have whatever it takes. Uh, we are ahead of time, thanks to the discipline that everybody has shown and sticking to the time allocated. So why don't you take it from wherever you want? Okay, thank thank you. This was um, incredibly uh, interesting, uh, thought provoking, uh, useful. Um, I'm I'm grateful. Uh, thank you, sincerely. Uh, perhaps I um, I'll go in the order that uh, people uh, 
presented and, and do my best to, to cover some of the, the highlights. Um, uh, both um, Nancy and Hilde asked about you know, why the logic of, of social science. Um, actually, I, I, when I came up with the title, I didn't think that the would produce a controversy. I suppose is what I had in mind was the book was advocating for a particular approach uh, to uh, social science, uh, scientific constructivism. And so the logic of social science or, uh, could be interpreted as the approach for social science, which is scientific constructivism. And scientific constructivism is both an epistemology in embracing science uh, and uh, an ontology uh, embracing an understanding of, of categories, at least social categories, as depending on us uh, and our uh, shared understandings. Um, I also uh, do argue in the book that set theoretic analysis is the way in which we can best instantiate scientific constructivism. In principle, one could be a scientific constructivist, but dislike set theoretic analysis. Uh, I argue that there's uh, it set theoretic analysis naturally fits with scientific constructivism as long as we understand sets as conceptual spaces in the mind, then it all falls neatly uh, uh, into place. And so the logic of social science also, uh, the the refers to uh, set theoretic analysis as the way to uh, implement a scientific constructivist approach uh, in, in, in research. Um, Nancy's uh, slide said, essentially, um, anything you want to do with sets, I can do with equations, but equations can do more. Uh, and I'm not, uh, for the for, for this particular talk, I'm not going to defend uh, set theoretic analysis. I'm going to leave it to Karsten or someone else to uh, defend set theoretic analysis uh, against that particular uh, 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 concern. Uh, there is a literature uh, on the differences between uh, statistical equations uh, and Boolean equations. Um, I don't think uh, a standard uh, statistical theory rooted in probability theory uh, and um, uh, uh, it, and linear algebra uh, uh, can do what set theoretic analysis uh, can do. I think set theoretic analysis is ultimately rooted in Boolean algebra. And so they're both mathematical approaches, but I think they have different mathematical foundations. And I think those different foundations, it's very similar uh, to the differences between logic and statistics. And so when I hear the argument that we can do everything with variables and equations, it, it, it sounds, it, I, I, I react the same way that I would react if someone said, you don't need to take your logic classes because statistics does it all. And it, that's not true. They're not, they don't overlap perfectly. And, and, and knowing statistics does not make logic uh, redundant. Uh, by the same token, you can't do everything that fuzzy set analysis can do uh, with uh, uh, statistical equations and, and variables. And there is a literature on this for sure. It's debated. You know, clearly Nancy's reaction suggests that the debate uh, is far from over. Um, and I'm going to ask any of the QCA uh, people uh, in the audience to help me uh, uh, on this point, uh, articulate why fuzzy set analysis uh, uh, or why statistics doesn't make fuzzy set analysis uh, unnecessary uh, and redundant. Um, now on to um, Nancy, some of her, her, her Four uh, criticisms. Uh, the I think one of our differences uh, has to do with: is it useful to talk about the degree to which categories are mind dependent? And I guess my question to Nancy would be: Do you think the extent of mind dependence of categories varies? And um, if so, do you think that that matters? Because my argument uh, is. Uh, I could share the slide again, is that uh, categories vary in the degree to which uh, they depend upon collective understandings. And I'm willing to uh, 
uh, argue that uh, entities like uh, 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 uranium or copper, uh, the, the atom copper, uh, don't much depend upon us. And that if we all disappeared, uh, uh, copper would have pretty much the same form uh, that it has uh, 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 right now. And uh, uh, that is our models of, of uranium or copper or the particles or the, or the chemical elements in general uh, capture an, an objective reality that largely exists independently of us. I'm aware that our understanding of electron has shifted over time and that we understand quarks in different ways over time. And so I agree that they're not perfect natural kinds that exist entirely independent of us, uh, but we're capturing some reality uh, that's out there with our, with our best scientific theories that doesn't depend on us. Um, and I also in, uh, uh, in the book uh, uh, suggest that logic uh, uh, is another um, system, uh, uh, basically classical logic is a system that doesn't depend on us, that uh, it's, um, it's part of the fabric of reality, uh, independent of human beings. And the degree to which uh, entities are natural kinds varies. Uh, in the social sciences, uh, my argument is we're working with categories that are not at all close to natural kinds. If, if all human beings were to disappear, democratic regimes would obviously all, all, all disappear. Um, uh, and not only because the humans that uh, make up those democratic regimes are, are no longer around, or uh, uh, if, if we were to live in a society of, of a hunter-gatherer society, lots and lots of entities would suddenly disappear uh, within that society because they're dependent upon our collective understandings. And so I, the, the argument that uh, everything's constructed, electrons are constructed and democratic regimes are constructed, I think it doesn't do justice to my argument that there's variation in the degree of mind dependence uh, for categories. And I think natural scientists are hunting for natural kinds and succeeding. I think social scientists are working with socially constructed categories, by which I mean mind dependent categories. Natural science categories, many of them don't change much over time. Social science categories, they change from one community to the next, they shift a lot over time. What we mean by democracy now is really different than what we meant by democracy in 1900. And it, I'm sure in 50 years, we'll change our, our understanding of democracy uh, as well. So um, that's my uh, uh, response to um, uh, that argument. I agree that social science can work. I think set theoretic analysis is the way to do it. If we want to make predictions, uh, we can notice regularities using set theoretic analysis, and those regularities allow us to make predictions if, if, if we wish. It's possible that they allow us to manipulate the world, but we don't have any special reason to, to uh, think that we can uh, necessarily manipulate the world, because I do subscribe to a Humean uh, understanding of, of, of causality such that even if we know that X is necessary for, for Y, um, it, it uh, doesn't necessarily follow that if, if we take away X, that Y will disappear uh, uh, in the real world uh, because that pattern may, sh may shift. Um, let's see. Uh, um, a key argument of mine is that human beings are wired to think in essentialist uh uh, terms. And this argument is rooted in a large literature, uh, mainly by psychologists who work on psychological essentialism, uh, that we are hardwired uh, to view the world uh, 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 in, a, in an essentialist way. And so to be a constructivist requires overcoming uh, that natural disposition to view the world as consisting of entities that have essences that, that hold them together. Uh, to um, be a constructivist uh, requires work uh, and effort, I believe. It requires uh, overcoming a bias uh, that we have. That, and uh, th this bias was very useful to human beings. I think it's uh, the fact that we have psychological essentialism is very much linked to our ability 
to establish in social institutions. And without our, if, if we were continuously noticing that everything is reified and depends upon our, our, our collective uh, agreements and understandings, we might not be able to hold up society. It might all uh, uh, come spinning apart. Uh, but we do have this disposition, this psychological essentialism, which serves this very valuable role. But to be social scientists, at least constructivist social scientists, requires overcoming uh, uh, that disposition and, uh, and rejecting it and recognizing that our categories uh, are um, mind dependent. Uh, I reject Kant in that you, I, I believe in natural kinds or something approximating natural kinds. Uh, I'm, it's for me, uh, constructivism is local constructivism. Uh, the uh, in some ways, I have a correspondence theory. You know, I think social categories correspond to conceptual spaces in human minds, and I treat conceptual spaces as at least partial natural kinds. I treat them as real entities, uh, and so I'm grounding uh, 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 this, my spatial sets in, in a correspondence theory where they're corresponding to real things uh, 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 in our our brains. I don't think there's uh, there's many scholars who uh, drive who, who distinguish sciences according to the extent to which the categories studied are dependent upon human minds. But that's where I'm at, and I think an important component of, of science should be to determine which entities depend heavily on us and which ones uh, do not. I'm going to shift now to uh, Rosa's comments. I think I can be fairly brief with Rosa because we agree on so much. Uh, 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 I, I have I don't have a lot to to disagree with. Um, I as I understood her uh, comments, in a, in effect, she uh, accepted scientific constructivism uh, and said that. Uh, it, I guess my disagreement would be she said that that's widely um, uh, uh, accepted. It may be widely accepted among philosophers, but I think it's 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 not widely accepted among social scientists. I think most social scientists are hardcore essentialist, and they would see my argument for uh, constructivism as mumbo jumbo or or anti scientific or postmodern, or they would dismiss it uh, out of hand. Um, how do we determine set boundaries? Uh, I. Charles Reagan uh, does present quantitative ways of doing this and algorithms for converting quantitative data into to fuzzy sets. You know, I'm not a fan of, of, of that kind of conversion. Uh, I, I like your second uh, mode of, of what you call descriptive inferences for drawing the set boundaries, for figuring out what categories mean within communities and then um, using uh, 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 those meanings as the basis for calibrating your sets, that is for drawing the boundaries. Uh, uh, with your set theoretic uh, analysis. And I think this is why ethnography and interpretive research is so valuable, because often we do want to use the meanings of categories as they are used in certain communities in the real world. And to do that, ethnography and interpretation is extremely helpful for understanding how the categories uh, are used within particular semantic communities. Once we've calibrated a category, you can convert it back into a variable. You tend to lose a lot of information. I think a well-calibrated set embodies a lot of information, a lot more information uh, uh, than a variable. Uh, I, I know that the normal way in which people think about things is in order to use set theoretic analysis, we have to lose a lot of information as we move from variables to sets. But I think that has a completely backward you, uh, the set embodies a lot of information. It embodies understandings of meanings within a community. And then to convert that into a, a variable, uh, a continuous variable, uh, entails a, a, a loss of information. Uh, you've gotten the consequences of semantic context uh, uh, for causal inference uh, essentially exactly right. Uh, if we change the meaning of our categories, uh, the, our findings change. And you're right that I think that the meaning of a proposition, uh, X is necessary for Y, depends on the meaning of X and Y. And if we say, oh, I mean something different by X, we've changed the proposition. It's a new proposition. It's not, it's not the same proposition. And so, uh, and I think a wide spectrum of social scientists can 
can subscribe to this because I think social scientists do realize that our findings, they, I think they would phrase it as our findings are relative to our definitions. And if we change the definition of our concepts, of course we can, that can alter our findings. And my point is when we change definitions of categories, the way to look at it is you're creating a new proposition. And then that gets me in exactly the way you described, Rosa, out of the truth relativism uh, dilemma. Um, and sometimes we just pretend to be uh, in a semantic community. You know, when I read, for example, the Reagan and Fisk book on intersectional inequality, I may not uh, love all of their definitions of the category. Some of their definitions follow the U.S. Census Bureau. And they say, we're just understanding this category the way the U.S. Census Bureau understands it. As long as I can follow them, I'm happy. Uh, and you know, I could redo their research with my own definitions of, of the categories if, if I wanted. Um, uh, but theirs seem you know, reasonable. And so I, I, I follow along and, and go with them and pretend to be in the same semantic community as they are. Um, now, your, uh, your last point was profound, I think. Uh, are there good reasons for, to have certain definitions and certain calibrations? Do experts have a special status? Are some categorizations and some ways of drawing the boundaries better than, than others? And you are right that the book says, doesn't say anything about that. Uh, and um, uh, I think your intuition uh, is right that there must be some, uh, I th most of the time for most categories, we assume that there's a fairly widely accepted definition of, of the category. And there, th that must be at least partially true because we have so much intersubjective understanding when we communicate that that's uh, on the face of it evidence that Lots of categories do have implicitly just a widely accepted uh, definition. For our set theoretic analysis, we want to be really clear on the definition for the small number of categories that we're, we're focused on. And um, I think it's an empirical question how researchers de determine the meanings of their, their categories and deciding that it, this is a good way of defining the category. Uh, sometimes they will appeal to experts, sometimes they'll appeal to common sense, sometimes they'll appeal to how the category is used in, in local communities. Uh, I think to say that this is a relativist dilemma highlights the relativism uh, a, a little too strongly. I think it's a dilemma, uh, and I think we do need to say more about how we come up with a, a good way of determining who gets to say what the categories mean, who gets to draw the boundaries and why. Uh, but I don't think there's any relativism here. If, it, and like I said, two people, I, I can understand and objectively assess somebody else's research, even if I don't agree with the way in which they're uh, conceptualizing categories. That's the science part of, of scientific constructivism. Um, uh, finally, on, on Hilde's uh, really interesting uh, 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 comments, um, one question I would have for Hilde is, uh, do you believe in natural kinds? Uh, do you believe in the distinction between human kinds and natural kinds? Or is, as I like to think of it as kind of more of a, of a continuum, what are your feelings about uh, natural kinds? How, how much of a constructivist uh, uh, are you? Do you go all the way? Uh, and in, uh, I know that you believe that electrons uh, depend in part on us, and I, I agree with that too, uh, in the sense that they depend a little bit on us, but I think they mostly don't depend on us. Do you think that electrons depend on us in the same way that democratic regime depends on us? And then if not, you know, what does that mean for you? Do you then uh, embrace my distinction between scientific essentialism for the natural sciences and and uh, scientific constructivism for the social sciences? And if you don't embrace that, then kind of why not, uh, uh, I, I would say. Um, let's see, this takes, uh, you're right that I do, um, you know, social categories are dependent on minds. And I make that very explicit and say there's conceptual spaces in minds that are are ultimately somehow rooted in neurological and chemical machinery and brains. And that does take the social out of the, the picture. Uh, I think that that's a fair and good uh, criticism. Um, I, my answer uh, would be 
I think people have similar conceptual spaces. Uh, and you know, what in the heck does, does, does he mean by that? I think we have a whole, uh, we want to use Nancy's uh, uh, um, metaphor, we have a whole system of boxes uh, in our brains. And some people have arranged the boxes in ways that are really similar to how other people have arranged the boxes. And when they talk about categories, they mean very similar things. And so if we talk about the category marriage, for example, because we're here uh, in Western countries, we probably have lots of similarities and uh, and uh, we would be able to say marriage, we would be able to say lots of similar things about marriage because it's related to, in our brains, to lots of other conceptual spaces. And when we were confronted with weird examples, like our Tarzan and Jane married, we would have similar, we would say similar things about that. <laughs> because in our, our brain encodings are, are similar. And so uh, I think intersubjective understandings of categories depends upon people having similar brain encodings, or that is similar systems of conceptual spaces. Your alternative um, is to say that uh, the, the uh, locus of the categories is not really the brain, it's the locus of their meaning is in, in the communication itself. Uh, it, they exist in the expressions, their narrative uh, constructions. Mm -hmm. And um, I make the brain the locus because I'm ultimately um, uh, uh, an essentialist with respect to the natural sciences. And I think um, uh, uh, there are natural kinds. And I think uh, conceptual spaces are close to natural kinds or they have some resemblance to natural kinds. And I want to root social categories ultimately in natural kinds, because ultimately I think natural kinds are what are out there and what makes the world dynamic and, 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 and interesting. Uh, and, and I think, uh, so that's kind of why I make the move I do. My uh, challenge to you would be, I would want to see elaborated the view that social categories, the locus of, of their existence is in our expressions and in our narrative. I would want to. I would want to understand more how that works. Uh, I'm, I'm not rejecting it at, uh, uh, at this point, but I would want to understand what it means to say that the the locus of existence for a category uh, uh, is in the ex expressing of the of the category. Um, the book does accept logic as uh, um, as true. Uh, it accepts it as an objective feature of, of reality. You know, in, in, in some sense, of course, we all have to, uh, at least for the purposes of discussion, uh, embrace logic. Uh, otherwise, we can't really speak. Uh, and I go a little further and, and say that logic is woven into the fabric of, of reality. Uh, and that's consistent with my view that there's natural kinds uh, in the world and that scientists can discover how the world really is independent of, of, of human beings. That's not what social science does, but it's what natural science appropriately does. And so I do believe, it, I do accept the objectivity of, of, of logic. And then with that, uh, uh, a few other things are uh, become uh, objective, uh, including things like truth. Um, that said, um, uh, I think currently natural scientists, you know, they may not have discovered any pure natural kinds. Uh, I, I do believe our best examples are the kind of stuff that Brian Ellis uh, talks about. Uh, things like uh, the um, uh, standard model of particle physics. Now, um, on the business of mechanisms, and human regularity theory and 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 token causality. Uh, this is really interesting. And the first thing I want to say is, um, maybe I'll even share my screen for this real quick. I, I, I'm almost done, Karsten. Uh, this is uh, in the book. In the book, I distinguish uh, three uh, uh, kinds of, of, of ways of thinking about causality, causal power models, uh, uh, counterfactual potential outcomes models, and regularity models of, of causality. And I argue that they do all have a place in science. 
I think the causal power models, the idea that we have efficacious entities that have certain natures that require them to behave mm -hmm. in certain ways, I think that that is useful for thinking about natural kinds and why they're they're dynamic. And so causal power models, you know, uh, like the stuff that Salmon and Mumford are, are writing about, uh, uh, Nancy's written about this in some ways, I think that that's capturing how natural kinds work. Um, regularity models, um, I follow Hume that their X precedes Y in, t in time, and, and here it's time as a construct itself. Uh, X makes spatio-temporal contact with Y, where space and time are, are the ways in which we understand them, their constructions, and X is part of the, the minimized solution that's constantly conjoined with Y. I think that these models are best for the social sciences. The stuff that um, like um, uh, Woodward and 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 uh, uh, Chris Winship and and uh, Pearl and those people are advocating, I think it works pretty well for partial natural kinds. Partial natural kinds have these kind of probabilistic effects, and so I like the use of the potential outcomes model for certain things in epidemiology uh, and uh, for entities that. Uh, have a have substantial mind independence. I think that those models can be useful. So I and is why am I saying all this? And I'm saying it all to say that I am a causal pluralist. Uh, I I advocate different kinds of causality depending on this the sort of entity that's under study and depending on the degree to which it's independent of our minds. Regularity theories um, and token causality. Uh, yes, I, I I'm a case study researcher in my own in my other life as a social scientist. I I study particular outcomes, uh, and the causes of particular outcomes, and and so how can I be a human regularity uh, uh, analyst when I'm looking at individual cases? Uh, I I am a human regularity analyst because I think when we make causal assertions about individual cases, we're invoking counterfactual cases or or possible cases. And the regularity uh, with token causality refers to the one actual case that we have and lots and lots of, of counterfactual cases or possible cases. And so to say that, um, uh, uh, ec let's, to say that um, uh, uh, Donald Trump's uh, presidency was um, a necessary condition for contemporary polarization in the United States that's a token level statement. Um, I think is what we we do though when we say that is we imagine lots of counterfactual cases. Uh, uh, many of them have Don Donald Trump as president. Many of them don't have Donald Trump as president. Uh, these cases are similar to our own actual world, kind of in the ways that uh, Lewis uh, suggests. Uh, and it turns out that in those counterfactual cases that that lack Donald Trump. Um, most of them or all of them uh, don't have the same kind of polarization that we have today. And so the regularity uh, exists. It's just a regularity that only happens to have one actual case and lots of counterfactual, non-actual possible world uh, cases. And so that's how I square uh, a token causality with a regularity uh, a theory. Uh, on um, mechanisms, uh, because I subscribe to a regularity theory, I, I view mechanisms as just uh, intervening steps uh, in a causal chain, uh, which is how I think David Hume uh, understood causality, at least in some of his writings when he when he he was explicit. And so a regularity theory connects X with Y by virtue of a bunch of smaller regularities uh, along the way. You know, ideally, those regularities are incredibly tight and almost tautological, so that each step seems almost tautological. And as long as X and Y don't seem tautological at all, it's great to connect them by virtue of a bunch of almost tautological links. Uh, so that's how I think about mechanisms for a regularity theory. I, I use the word mechanism different for causal power theories and when thinking about natural kinds. I use the word mechanism for natural kinds to refer to their essences, which give them inherent dispositions and make them uh, active entities uh, uh, in the world. And so there's mechanism that corresponds to regularity theory, and there's mechanism that corresponds 
to um, natural kinds. And uh, those are very different uses of the expression mechanism. And as we all know, there's lots of definitions of mechanism and the term is, is, is used in, in, in lots of different ways. Uh, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Jim. Very helpful. There is, a, uh, if I monitor the chat uh, correctly, Nancy, you want to contribute something after you were uh, sort of kicked out for technical reasons. Is this correct? Uh, I had just wanted to make a clarification, uh, which I put in the chat. Uh, I said equations and variables. I wrote an equation. It was a linear equation. Um, it had a, a boost factor, an A in it. I never uttered the word probability or statistics. Um, and so rejoinder that you can't do everything with statistics that you can do with step theory um, doesn't quite answer. But also, I don't believe that. Um, uh, for instance, uh, I forgot what the term is, but you're interested in how um, the amount of overlap compares to the size of the two sets. What's the word for that? Uh, uh, it's set coincidence is oh, no, one, I can't one you word. Guys. Uh, oh, God. Anyway, uh, so I'll just finish and then I'll try and sort out. It keeps going wrong everything here. Um, anyway, I, I can do that with conditional probabilities on dichotomous variables. Uh, and so I, you know, I believe that, you know, um, I can do a lot with probabilities that you probably think I can't, one can't do. Um, so but anyway, I wanted to clarify, I had some equations and I have not thought about, you know, can you do everything? If you don't have any equations, can you do everything with just um, probabilities uh, over an event space? That was the first thing. And the other thing is I, I would like there to be a distinction between things that are mind dependent in the sense that um, if we all die, you know, there wouldn't be any priests anymore. Okay, I agree with that. Um, but I think that, I mean, I would find it hard to be able to distinguish that it's every bit as true that my friend Peter is a priest as it is that uh, my, you know, I don't know, the book is. Uh, the book has a modernist picture on the front, or whatever. The book is a work, <laughs> okay? Or uh, this electron has this particular charge. Uh, I can't see how you can, um, uh, I mean, it's claiming, I mean, I agree, mind dependent. We, if we weren't here, there wouldn't be any priests, um, but we can't just by uh, changing, you can, you can use language differently, but you can't just go around and change the fact that Peter is a priest. That depends on the whole social structure as it really is. It, that was all I wanted to say. And sorry, I'm gonna try and figure out how to hear you folks. But but we heard you, that uh, was all good. I can't hear. Uh, I think Rosa, you wanted to say something then Hilda, and uh, of course, everyone else is invited too. Okay, perfect. Can you hear me all right? Everyone except Nancy. Yep. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. So uh, I wanted to draw out, um, I think, a tension between what Hilda was saying and Jim was saying in um, his response. So Jim said, most of the time for most categories, we think that there's a widely accepted definition of the category, right? And this must be because we have some, some kind of intersubjective understanding when we communicate. Uh, it's then an empirical question how researchers can determine the meaning of their categories. And so we need to find a good way to do that. And I think that that's a very nice way to solve bits of, of what I was saying and then I was concluding. Then Hilda says, but listen, if we root these sets in the brain, constructivism makes set into individual things rather than shared conceptions. And I think that this is where, where the problem comes in, right? So to that, I have, I think, two answers. And I think they are quite intuitive, quite rough, but it, this is what, how I think about this. So, Firstly, in Jim's framework, I would think that most sets are partially learned within a community, right? As part of learning a language, say, as for purposes of communication. It just happens to be that I teach my children certain terms. And in Jim's framework, these are sets related terms, but you know. Um, and I would think that it's this learning that might create this shared conception. And there's a second way to answer. And that is to say that certain sets are constructed as a group, right? So for instance, the World Bank might create 
a set with certain boundaries together, right? That's what they do. And this that doesn't then make any claims about whether there's like a neurobiological equivalent uh, in all of these World Bank policy people. I don't, I didn't really want to go into that. I think I'm personally quite indifferent to all of this. Um, I'm more pragmatic about this. Um, and all of this made me think as in, in a final solution of uh, this very old example in uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Revisionist History podcast. He's talking about the owners, the set of owners of a Gal Californian golf course, right? And he says, this is directly in the state constitution. Um, so of course there's a right answer there as to who constitute the members of this set um, or think of US presidents, right? There's definitely sets for which there are correct boundaries. And then on the other hand, there are sets for which there aren't, arguably, and never will be, for instance, you know, beautiful paintings, right? My husband and I regularly disagree about that, even though we share meanings across a lot of other things, and we are, in some senses of the word, in the same semantic community, we're definitely not on that, right? So I think that that's a partial answer to, I think, the worry Hilde had, and on the other hand, also um, a way to think about how to construct these categories and the boundaries depending on you know, which of these three things we fall into, whether it's a learned set or whether it's a constructed set or whether it's perhaps a legally formalized set. Um, and that might be a nice way to, to get into this. I'm really interested to hear what the two of you have to say about that. Hilde, you want to follow up on this? Or yeah, yeah, just, I, I mean, first of all, Rosa, just thanks for this uh, rejoinder, I guess. What I wanted to do is just like briefly clarify, because I think that's something that Nancy just said as well, that there, it's not like I'm saying that social kinds in a way you see and that democracy has a similar type of realness to it than like my glass here that has very clear properties and, and you know, things that I can do with. Um, the point is just that our knowledge of it, our understanding of what we can do with this glass is similarly constructed and similarly contingent on our previous understandings and the way we interpret our observations and how we make sense of that. And I think something is really interesting and, and something you say fairly explicitly in your book, and, and I didn't bring that up, but there's points in the book where you essentially make the mind, the, the construct that we have fully, but really completely independent of any reality. Um, so I'm quoting you now because I just found it. I had some time to look it up. Page 22, uh, the mind independent composition of the reference has nothing to do with the meaning of the category. Um, and so there, I was actually fairly surprised because I would say, no, well, generally there is some correspondence between what we observe and then how we construct and how we construct our knowledge about and how we think of that. So it's not the, the, the point is just when it comes to truth and objectivity, that was kind of where I got into this. Um, those two are constructs. So I definitely agree that things that we study are social constructs and that there is a more natural type of way of understanding this glass or, or atoms or that they have a more a different type of realness to them. The point is just that our knowledge is socially constructed and that is not different uh, between natural and human kinds, I think. And if I can just one one little thing on the regularity, uh, what I what I've noticed in your description or in your answer when you say, well, but I take set theory and then regularities at this within case level or the single case by adding a counterfactual. But my argument here would be is that that is still a regularity, and you're still adding an additional case. It's just that this case is, and I'm going to say this slightly pejoratively, made up but it's still a second case that you're adding uh, to the equation, so to say. Jim, you want to briefly, and then we have also some other questions in the audience. But... Sure, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Nancy, for that clarification. And, and the QCA team that I have, have mobilized to respond to you can, can take that into consideration uh, 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 as well. Um, let's see, uh, I think your three types uh, of learning and 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 creation of a set and then uh, kind of uh, like the legal mode is excellent, Rosa. And um, I think that that's you know fresh, uh, original, and you know worth worth developing. You know, I I have to sit with it for a while to have more thoughtful things to say about it. But my kind of a gut reaction is that's a very useful uh, typology. 
And um, then finally um, on uh, Hill Day, that passage you read, um, I mean, it was, I, I, it wasn't, um, it, it was in this larger conversation on, on page 22 where I wanted to say, um, what is the ideal type of a humankind? And the ideal type is no mind, um, uh, um, uh, uh, it's fully mind dependent. But I, then if you read the paragraph, it says, I propose that existing categories in the natural and social sciences fall between these two extremes. For all or nearly all existing categories, the relationship between the meaning and the reference is one of mutual constitution and reciprocal causation. Individual categories fall along a continuum according to the extent to which the meaning versus the reference is the primary constitutive element in the relationship. And so that's how I think about it. It's a continuum for me. There is this ideal type of a natural kind where human minds have nothing to do with it. And this ideal type of a human kind where it's all human minds. I'm arguing that there's a big continuum in the middle. Categories do tend to fall to one side or, or the other, but they don't fall into the, the ultimate extremes. And then I don't know that we're disagreeing on the regularity theory. Uh, I do agree that a regularity theory is a, is the regularity is type, uh, but it allows us to talk about tokens. As long as, uh, it, it, that is to say the regularity is many cases, some of them made up. Um, and that allows us to talk about the one actual case in the real world that we're interested in. And so we're interested in Trump's effect on political polarization and that only happened once. Uh, we can do that by virtue of positing these other made up cases and, and working with them and and finding a regularity that exists with those made up cases and then situating the one actual token that we have uh, uh, within that regularity and so I, I i wonder if we really if we if we're disagreeing or if this is something about semantics i'm going to stop there before i pass the floor um and since i was called on uh, on this proposition by Nancy that everything we can do with uh, sets we can do with equations. This is a, a, a recurrent point made about QCA. So we can, everything that QCA can be, can do, we can do with other methods. It's not exactly the same point, but I, I would agree that uh, if variables are thought of as quasi sets, namely that they dis, uh, uh, establish qualitative differences, that they are bound to the zero one interval, um, and that they measure the distance to the ideal type, then those variables uh, can be treated as sets because essentially they are sets. So, so I, I see that point. Um, and then <clears throat> uh, in this discussion of whether or not one can use different methods to achieve the same that QCA can use, maybe that's true. Uh, but first question, why would you make it more complicated? And oftentimes uh, those other alternative methods cannot achieve all the things that uh, set relations uh, methods like UCA deliver, such as uh, reveal conjunctions and disjunctions and asymmetry. So achieving all of those, I haven't seen any quantitative method that can, uh, uh, you know, pick all these three search target goals. So they have different search targets, other methods than QCA and therefore have to be really squeezed and tweaked uh, to an extent that I don't see the point. Why would you want to do this if you have already a tool that achieves it much better? Where I do not know whether or not they can mimic QCA results is with specific machine learning algorithms that do seem to uh, uh, produce results that can be read. Uh, in terms of, you know, equifinality, conjunctural causation. So, so I'm not dismissing or ruling out that there's other and maybe better ways of finding set relations than uh, uh, QCA. Um, but for the time being, I haven't seen this uh, necessarily. Markus, please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Markus Kreutzer. I'm a visiting professor here at CU. Um, and uh, I'm not a philosopher of science, so my comments are a little bit more mundane and humdrum. Uh, Jim, I wanted to pick up on a point that you made before. You said a lot of psychological work uh, to reiterate the point that essentialism is sort of like a human default uh, notion, right? It's sort of almost uh, uh, inborn. Uh, and then you complemented that with the point that to be a constructivist is actually really hard work. And I'm just wondering whether you care to elaborate on this 
and whether that explains some of these unproductive method wars that we're having. What I mean by that is, in effect, uh, we are through their standard methods training, right? So to think of, of econometrics and, and model, we are recreating essentialists, right, of a scholarly variety. And in the process are creating people who are uh, ontologically autistic and by being autistic have difficulties talking across sort of uh, uh, different methodological uh, schools of thoughts. So that's my first point. The second point is, are we seeing here like a, a Mahoney constructivist 2.0? That is in your earlier incarnation as a comparative historical analyst, you were a constructivist of sorts as well, right? I mean, when you were talking, you were talking about ontology. And so if that is correct, why did you move from being a comparative historical analyst to doing QCA? And what sort of is, was the intellectual trajectory and what is the value added for doing constructivism in a QCA version rather than a comparative historical analysis version? Marston, should I answer these, that question? Yes, please. I, may I add uh, one from the chat that I read out and I think we then take it in bulk. Um, um, so um, the question uh, reads as, uh, James Mahoney has just mentioned ideal types. I was wondering to what extent does that theoretical methodology differ from Weberian approaches and epistemology? Um, okay. Um, thank you for that uh, uh, comment. Uh, uh, let me start with the second half. You know, in my earlier work, I was uh, I did a lot of comparative historical work, and as I did it, I started to realize, oh, everything we're doing is set theoretic, and it's not statistical. And uh, the implicit methods that we're using are set theoretic methods. And I wrote, you know, a lot of methodological articles that uh, elaborated the set theoretic foundations of comparative historical research. And that ultimately culminated in the book with Gary Gertz, A Tale of Two Cultures, in which we argued uh, that qualitative research is ultimately rooted in logic and set theory, um, and uh, quantitative re research is ultimately rooted in, in statistics and probability theory, as practiced in, in political science and sociology at the time that we were writing uh, uh, the book. Um, and so uh, the notion that um, uh, comparative historical research is rooted in set theory is longstanding uh, uh, for me. Is what is is um, is what's new uh, is the notion that the um, uh, sets are uh, uh, are not referring to entities that are members of the set because they share properties. Like everyone else, I learned in social science that when we talk about democratic regimes, the, these these countries are members of are, are democratic regimes because they have certain properties that make them democratic regimes, and we should define them in terms of their essential properties. And that's that's what I did. And when I moved to set theoretic analysis, I assumed that they're members of the set of democratic regimes or partial members of it because. The, the properties that they possess. Um, but um, uh, once I started to realize, well, um, once I started down the constructivist road, I resisted it, uh, but I, it, it took me 10 years to sort of partially accept it and then another 10 years to fully embrace it. Let me put it that way. I was so reluctant uh, to um, uh, 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 make the move that our social categories mainly depend upon us rather than being objective properties out there in the world, that it took me you know, certainly more than a decade to, to uh, uh, come to that conclusion. And you, as I came to that conclusion and started to accept it, I realized just how hard it is to talk about entities in the world as if they don't have in objective properties that make them certain kinds of entities. And then when I came across the literature on psychological essentialism, I felt like it gave um, an empirical scientific basis to arguments in cognitive science and philosophy about constructivism. 
uh, it showed experimentally that we have this this bias in in dozens of of experiments. And again, I recommend Susan Gelman's work uh, as exceptional. Um, and then the pieces kind of fell into place, and it became a matter of do I dare say this? Do I dare write a book that that comes out as a of the closet as a constructivist uh, after having you know been established as a comparative historical social scientist. And, and um, I waited until later in my career to, to, to write that book. Um, and uh, I do believe it's really hard to uh, uh, think as, as a constructivist. It's really hard. I think it's hard to think set theoretically uh, to begin with. It's really hard to think about entities as, as being members of sets and to think about those entities or cases as themselves sets. And so we're just placing sets in relationship to sets. Countries are sets and we put those countries in, in democratic regime box or we put them partially in it. Uh, and um, that's how uh, social science should, should proceed. Uh, on the question of ideal types and Weber, yes, there's huge similarities between set theoretic analysis and, and, and ideal types. Um, there's two ways you can think about ideal types. One is you could treat the set as, as um, a set in which entities can never fully enter. Uh, it's an ideal type. And so you, the most you can have is 0.99 membership in the set. There's something ab uh, about the set that prohibits full membership. Another way to do it is to say that uh, the entities can never touch the prototype point at the center of the set. Uh, in this uh, cognitive spaces world, there's there's boundaries, and then at the center of those boundaries is a prototype, and it's possible to be a member, a full member of the set, uh, but not be able to uh, uh, overlap with the prototype of, of the set. And so I think that that's a good way of, of talking about ideal types. One other note on Weber. The early Weber, the Weber around 1900, uh, believed that what's out there in the world, we can't know. Uh, that it's a bunch of natural stuff that is infinitely complex. Uh, and he he drew on some other philosophers in, in believing this. And so he thought there was a massive referential disconnect between our categories and what's really out there uh, in the world. And when we recognize that early Weber, I see my project as neither new nor radical. I see it as an old project that... Uh, Weber himself was was uh, pursuing, and so uh, I mean, you know, at least that's how I look at it. Good. We still have a couple of minutes. If um, some thoughts, M maybe if I fill in the awkward silence for just a second on this type versus token level ca causation, uh, uh, Jim, I, you seem to resist in your answer the possibility that you could compare actual cases. And so, so I, I don't know why it would be such a problem to say that uh, to establish a, a full causal analysis requires that there is both a type level constant conjunction and a token level mechanism. And in case the evidence uh, contradicts so that you find maybe a type level uh, constant, but not a mechanism, then it's not a full causal and then it's not a cause. And then the question is, which of the two overrides the other? And I read the room such that we would say that token level is always stronger evidence than type level, but jointly they are stronger than one and the other. Or is this philosophically uh, promiscuous to say? It's a good question. Uh, and I think Hilde is you know, sympathetic to, to your, your question. And I may be just not tracking uh, uh, very well. Your argument of both of you is that token causation is prior to type causation uh, and that we derive type causation or it's, it's at least type causation is ontologically dependent upon token causation. Is that right, Hilde? No, I, I wouldn't put neither as prior to the other. I think that's a debate that is just not so fruitful. I think that there's just, if you'd say, I mean, you, you then get to the question, what is causation and where does causation exist, right? Does it exist in the regularities and then you're a human or does it exist at the token level at the specific cases and then you want to put it there? My logic would be more that probably there's very different 
types of causality, if you wish, right? There's different ways that it manifests itself and there's different ways that we can study it. And probably all of these are equally valuable and all of, on all of these methods, they tell us something about what's going on in the world. So some things may establish as regular regularities and then we can observe that and that would be useful, right? We can learn something from that. Now we know under which conditions um, something may lead to a particular regularity. Good, that's useful information that we can go. Um, but other things, it might be much more interesting to actually know something about the token level, what happened in this very specific case, how did that work out, and what are the mechanisms doing? But then for me, the idea of a mechanism would ultimately be much more active. And so what I have the feeling is that by reducing it back to set relations, you're taking away much of the value that is normally added by a focus on mechanisms and processes. Um, but right. when it comes to the token and type level, so it's not that I want to say that you should have either or the other prior. It's just that I had the feeling that there's a tension in the book that's not resolved um, because it talks about explicitly talks about token causality, but then adds to that a Jungian understanding, which is on the type level, without recognizing that there is a friction between these two and the book doesn't resolve it. Yeah. I know I see Nancy's hand up, so... Nancy, you're muted. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I, I would just want to add to that. that I think the um, use of counterfactuals uh, doesn't, I can't see how it gets around the tension that Hill is raising because I don't know how you figure out what happens in the counterfactual case. I mean, I'll tell you how my philosophy colleagues do they use other regularities or they use other things I call causal laws. But I mean, so I change, you know, you change one thing and ask, if you, anyway, they, you can't just look at another case. If you can't look at this case and see the causality, then when you move to another case and you want to say what actually you think is going to happen in that factual case, it looks to me like you're still stuck with having to have some additional notion that's that that's that contributes to the tension of this sequence. So I just want to add that. I think that's right, um, uh, Nancy, and I understand now better, Hilde. Um, I, I do think when you imagine the counterfactual case, it helps you understand better the intervening processes through which your X should connect to your Y. Uh, and just by virtue of making up these make believe cases. It helps you specify better, you know, if Donald Trump is elected, greater political polarization two years later. Uh, you know, it, what are the, the steps that we would expect to see? That's where the regularity theory, that's what it allows me, uh, is I can think about the intervening steps that stand between the election of Trump and the outcome that I'm interested in. In counterfactual cases, help me imagine those those intervening uh, steps. But um, you're right that uh, to really, for counterfactuals to really deliver, you need certain causal laws that we unfortunately usually don't have. I think even also here to a certain extent, I would never say counterfactuals are not useful or not a good tool for us to think through what it is that we're seeing or how things could be and, and how we can come to causality. So I think very frequently counterfactuals may be very useful and, and we should keep them in our toolbox. Um, it's just that there's still that tension. So that was my... Uh, On that note, <laughs> I shall say, uh, we have reached uh, the end of this talk, and, and and I might sound like a weirdo when I say that I, I sort of dreamt of such a discussion uh, for many years, and and so, so I'm I'm uh, deeply grateful for all um, the contributions. I I have uh, learned a lot, and I have been thinking about these things uh, for many years, and um, I very much appreciate the time that you all have spent on it. Also, those who have been listening to and. An, unusually long session and then unusually, uh, I mean, complicated. Not everybody was a philosopher in the room. And this is I, I, a sign of how interesting this uh, all was for, for everybody involved. Um, 
for us here in the room, there is some uh, wine and cheese reception. I unfortunately, I mean, I you invited, but uh, for the next time, we shall say when the next time we meet. Um, and there is a recording of this. We will have to see in which way we make this available to an even broader audience. Then um, uh, good night or good morning and good luck uh, to everyone. Thank you, Karsten. And and thank you all three for your outstanding comments. This is a once in a lifetime wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for you. organizing. Thanks for letting us comment. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks to Karsten again. Thanks. Yeah, he's true. That was good. Hey, nice, like to see. nice to see you too. Yeah. <laughs> Let's so, talk later. Yes, we will. All right. Bye. Have a good evening. <laughs>